I'd now like to introduce Dr. Stephen Duckett. Stephen is widely regarded as one of the most influential health system uh, managers and leaders in the Australian health scene over the last uh, 25 or more years. He was a previous secretary of the Commonwealth Department of Health and Ageing. He's led health systems uh, both within Australia and within Canada. He's an economist by training and an expert in activity-based funding and indeed uh, how we drive accountability for quality in healthcare. So, Stephen. Thanks very much, Rowan. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, Aboriginal founders of this land and to remind you that that sort of acknowledgement is, is not just a trite saying. Still, Aboriginal people li live much shorter lives uh, than the rest of us. And so we in the health system have got particular responsibilities to ensure our services are culturally acceptable, that we are providing the services that Aboriginal people need. I was asked to talk a bit about uh, what is health reform and how ABF fits into this reform and, and, in a sense, where we are up to nationally. I know Brian McCorn is in the audience, a surgeon, so I'll try and speak slower uh, so that he can uh, understand uh, what I have to say. Um, so just a bit about where, where it came from. This is a, a slide or a, a graph, a, a figure I prepared for the National Health and Hospital Reform Commission uh, a few years ago. And basically on the Reform Commission, we recognised that Australia was lacking in, in sort of national governance arrangements. There was the Commonwealth Government, the Commonwealth Department of Health and Ageing, and uh, so, uh, but there were no real national, national organisations to help us uh, think of Australia as a country rather than a set of eight uh, states and territories and a national government. And so we recognised the need for overarching roles and responsibilities. We also recognised the need for specific service changes and service elements and for integrating and cross-country cutting uh, uh, responsibilities. And these service elements, we, we recognise the need for reform in prevention and early detection, reform in the primary care system, reform in coordinated care for people with uh, chronic illnesses and so on. And we put it all together in this little simple slide uh, about the sorts of changes necessary in the healthcare system. And of course, you can see that activity-based funding was there, uh, where it says something along the lines, a national payment agency with a minimum payment schedule, and that translated into the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority. So that you can see where it fits, so I may as well sit down next now, even though I've got 13 minutes and six seconds left. So what did the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission actually say? Well, it said something along the lines it wanted to have efficient activity-based funding for hospitals using case mix classification. And this was, this was done for a couple of reasons. One was the obvious need for efficiency improvements, and I'll come back to that. But the other, and, and something that Mary has already referred to, was the, the, the benefit in terms of transparency. And that is, in fact, a major uh, objective nationally and allows funders to compare the cost across different health services providers, such as the data Mary has shown you. But uh, what, what's the difference in, in what you'd sort of previously had? Well, there's a, an obvious identity in health expenditure, that the, the total amount of money that's spent in the health system in any population is a, is a multiplication of the, the, uh, the number of people, sort of weighted for age and sex and so on, how much they use health services, what sort of health services are the case mix and so on, and the and a, a number of services per admission, such as the number of days of stay or the number of pathology tests per admission, and uh, the cost per service, the cost per day of stay, the cost per pathology test, and so on. Under uh, act, uh, population funding arrangements, uh, the, the funder, New South Wales Health, in, in this instance, took responsibility for the size of the population and adjusted uh, populations ba funding allegedly based on area, health, on area needs and population, and the Area Health Authority took responsibility for the rest and allegedly was accountable for all the rest. But interestingly, in these sorts of environments, it's actually very difficult to shift in utilisation rates, a very, very slow process possible, but you, you know, you've, you've got to shift to admission, the doctor practice and so on. Uh, in contrast, uh, and it, we weren't actually terribly successful in shifting many, much utilisation rates. In contrast, activity-based funding shifts the boundaries of responsibilities so that the, the funder takes responsibility for the utilisation rate variation, essentially, for the population, for the case mix, and sheets very clearly home to the local hospital network or the, or the district or the hospital responsibility for the variation in the cost of service once you're admitted. 
And of course, there are two groups that have to be explicitly and integrally involved in addressing that. That's the people who essentially drive the services per admission, the days of stay, or the number of pathology tests that are ordered, and the people who are responsible for the efficiency of those pathology tests and so on, generally speaking, dividing it up into clinical and, and, and departmental leadership. So what is national health reform? Well, there's a thing called, a document called the National Health Reform Agreement, which has a number of components, not only about activity-based funding. And it says that the Commonwealth and the states will work in partnership. Uh, partnership is an interesting word. Um, still a little bit of a work in progress, I think, in Australia, uh, in terms of the relationship between the Commonwealth and the states. Uh, and they're aiming for a nationally unified and locally controlled health system. Very important concepts, and again, Mary has spoken about the need for local responsibility and local autonomy and the ability to, ch to change and adapt to local needs. And you just don't do those things, you know, the hugs in partnership and all that sort of stuff for their own sake, although hugs are good, but you do it for a number of reasons. One, to improve patient access to services and to improve efficiency. These are direct quotes from the, from the reform agreement. Secondly, to ensure the sustainability of funding by increasing the Commonwealth share, which is going to dramatically change from about 37% now of public hospital funding to about 37.2% uh, over the next 20 years or so. So, you know, a major shift is occurring uh, through an increased contribution to the cost of growth and improved transparency again. But it's not only about hospitals improving standards of, of, of clinical care, it's about improving performance reporting, it's about improving accountability, it's about improving local accountability, uh, responsiveness, and so on. So the national health reform is across a broad range of things which are supposed to all work together. When you think about how to change health systems, there are a limited number of uh, top-down levers you have. There are bottom-up levers about uh, driving reform through consumer pressure and so on, which I don't want to underestimate. But they're, they're about shifting culture and shifting values, very hard to do, about using financial incentives, about using organisational change and structures and, and, and so on, about attempting to change policy through information provision by benchmarking comparisons, and of course, uh, using rhetoric to, to change policy as well. It, it helps, of course, if all these levers are working in the same direction. I've worked in systems where they're not. But the, the from a... Um, in terms of activity-based funding, it's principally in that, uh, I don't think I've got a little thing out here, but, but the financial incentives um, is what we're really talking about, shifting behaviour of the system by changing the nature of the financial incentives. From a hospital and local health network perspective, there are two main changes uh, in terms of national gender transparency that Mary's spoken about and changing the incentives. And the change incentives are of two kinds. First, they're in changed incentives on the Commonwealth. And this is actually, I think, particularly important and particularly important for the long term. Post-2014, the Commonwealth shares in the cost of hospital activity growth. This is the first time this has happened. And so rather than just saying, look, we don't really care, it's up to the states, it, it, prior to July 2014, the states bore the full marginal cost of any additional hospital activity in this country. Post-2014, the Commonwealth will share 45% of the cost of growth. And one, what we we're keen to do on the, on the National Health and Hospital Reform Commission was sort of the grit, grit in the oyster theory. That is, if the Commonwealth is exposed to the cost of hospital growth, for the first time it has an incentive to try and improve primary health care systems to slow that rate of growth. So although you might say, if you're a primary health advocate, oh, isn't it terrible that all the focus is going to be on hospitals and all the incentive is going to be to increase and, and for hospitals to increase, it also, for the first time, allows the Department of Health and Ageing to put a business case to Treasury to say, if we invest in prevention, if we invest in primary health care better, then we've got a chance of saving Commonwealth money, not only state money. And this grit in the oyster, this trying to change the system, hopefully, for the first time, we'll see a pearl emerge from Canberra. So the, the, second, the, second, the second type of change is not only changing the efficiency incentives on hospitals, but also change, uh, on, on the Commonwealth, but also changing the efficiency incentives on hospitals uh, uh, to actually allow comparison to actually drive some change. And why did this focus on hospital efficiency? First of all, health costs are increasing, especially the share of public sector spending. 
and hospital costs are increasing within that. So to give you an example, this is from a Grattan report. The, the bottom axis is how much money uh, was spent in each of these sectors uh, about a decade ago, and the, the, uh, the vertical axis is how much things have changed since then. So the bigger, the, 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 the fatter the, uh, the, the, the bar is, the bigger its spending share was back a decade ago, and the taller it is, the bigger that share is now. And so what you can see is that a couple of areas have increased faster than the gross domestic product. Uh, welfare, defence, not. Ageing and aged care services in increased much faster than gross domestic product, but from a very narrow base. The big shift, starting from a relatively big base and growing much faster than GDP, was health expenditure. That's across all areas. This is Commonwealth putting together Commonwealth budgets and all the state budgets across all areas. So health is one of the fastest growing and biggest areas of government spending over the last couple of decades. And if it continues, it's going to take up 2% more of GDP. Within health, it's hospitals. Again, the same sort of graph. So the fatness indicates uh, how, how big it was in 20, 2002, so three. The height, how much change. The biggest single demand on Healthcare budgets has been hospitals. And there's huge variations. This is a slide showing across Australia uh, the, the significant variation. Each of those little bars is, uh, is a hospital. And you've got one hospital at the extreme right-hand side at $7,000 on average per weight of separation. Uh, another one, uh, half that. This one is just for hip replacements. And this is 2010-2011 data. All of the hospitals, uh, about 270 hospitals in this, in, this, uh, um, in this slide. The big heavy black bar is, is the median, about uh, just about $18,000 per hip replacement without comorbidity or complications. And 50% uh, of observations of hospitals are within the, within the box. If you look at, say, the seven biggest, the, hosp the hospitals in Australia, the seven hospitals in Australia which do most hip replacements, a few of them, Again, are sitting around that same price, eighteen to twenty thousand dollars per case. A couple of them are almost half of that. No, not almost half. A couple of them about the ten or twelve thousand dollars per case. Huge variations in hospital efficiency, uh, and not related to size. So we've got uh, activity-based funding working on the financial incentives. There's going to be increased funding in, uh, from the Commonwealth in 2014. The National Health Performance Authority is working on the information provision and the creation of local hospital networks, creation of medical locals, is working on that organisational change dimension. So health reform involves operating on a number of dimensions at a number of different levels. So what actually does the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority do? How is it going to change? One of its roles is to determine the national efficient price, and it does that every year. Uh, this year and next year, it doesn't actually change the way, the amount of money that flows to the states, it just changes the way it's prescribed. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of transition years this year we're in. It's a transition year where uh, the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority determines the prices for inpatients, outpatients, emergency department. Next year, more activities are going to have pricing. Um, the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority still hasn't worked out the best way of describing mental health care in the long term, and that's uh, a work in progress. Um, they've worked out, as Mary said, what they're doing on efficient costs for, for smaller hospitals. 2014-15 is the first change year, and that will be a significant uh, impact uh, across the system. So what is happening, or where are we at with national health reform? Uh, and this is just focusing on the activity-based funding. Well, the system architecture is in place, that, that national level architecture of the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority and the National Health Performance Authority. The local arch architecture is by and large in place with the new networks in all the states and so on. Uh, 2013. I expect to see there will be more progress on work on determining the classifications, getting uh, AN SNAP uh, finalised, working out what to do about mental health, possibly doing a costing study in mental health nationally. Question mark, have the hospitals been able to adopt, have the local hospital networks been able to adapt and make sure they've got the management capacity to work in the new system rather than the old shades of grey system that Mary showed you where different skills are necessary. Have local clinical engagement strategies been appropriately developed? Are they all in place? Because with an activity-based funding environment, you need to have both the clinicians 
and the managers talking together and working together to address the issues on that right side of that uh, spectrum I showed about cost per day and days per stay. And 2014, 15, obviously the additional Commonwealth funds will follow, and hopefully there won't be the question marks that I've put on the 2013 about uh, management competencies and local engagement strategies. Thank you very much. <laughs>